Uh, well, so thank you very much, Barbara. And um, it's terrific to be here. I feel um, inspired with a lot of the things that um, uh, Superintendent Flanagan said and then that have taken place throughout the day. It um, makes you want to try and help make things better uh, by letting people know how things are uh, and, and then move forward from there. Um, I am, my job is to uh, lead my team here in talking about uh, the teacher composition, how teacher composition, uh, what it's looked like in the last few years and maybe how that's related to the implementation of the Michigan Merit Curriculum. Uh, and then we're really using this with an eye toward thinking about how schools are, have responded, changed, adapted, what you will, to the Michigan Merit Curriculum. Uh, and this goes towards some of the comments from the morning about implementation and fidelity. And so with that, I'll just, uh, it, it culminates in a sense as we get into the schools uh, with our transcript study and start to learn more about not only what's offered and what's taken, but what's taught and who the people are who are teaching it. So that's all where this is going. And so I'll just give Karen one more plug that we're all uh, on board with that very much so. And we, we are, we're hoping that we'll be able to get the data to get more deeply into these issues. Um, so uh, the questions that we'll be asking are uh, how have high schools reallocated teaching positions to meet curricular changes? What has been the impact of the Michigan Merit Curriculum uh, on the balance of teachers in terms of MM, Michigan Merit Curriculum teachers versus non-MMC teachers. And just the backdrop for this that's sort of been in, in the behind all day, but it's been very much in the forefront of our minds, has to do with the economic conditions of Michigan. Because when you start to think about the teachers and their hiring, their, well, the context that they're teaching in, and the Michigan Merit Curriculum, you want to be thinking about what the economy in Michigan has been like uh, during the course of the time that we're studying. This slide here represents uh, uh, the state of the economy, if you will, in terms of per capita income from 2000 to 2010 with lines, uh, the, the dark line on the right is roughly where the implementation of the Michigan Merit Curriculum was in 2007. Um, and so what you see here is that this is labeled a one state recession starting around 2003. The, the per capita income really dipped a bit in Michigan and it was going up nationally. Uh, and then ha never really has recovered. It kind of, uh, once the national recession hit in about 2008, Michigan paralleled the, na paralleled the national recession. Uh, so it gives you a feel for the economic conditions that exist and have been accumulating uh, prior to, or accumulated prior to the implementation of the Michigan Merit Curriculum. And as, um, the people, some of the graduate students and the other members of our team have been walking around the room over the last uh, few hours asking about hiring practices and teacher issues. Certainly the economic conditions came up. Uh, and I just want to thank Beth Guan and Caitlin for uh, doing some of the legwork on that. And I'll be talking about that. Okay, so one of the things that we have observed is we've just used this large scale database just to look at teacher, pupil per teacher ratios and how have they changed over time. Uh, starting from 2004, roughly our base year, to 2011. And what you see is that they went up uh, fairly significantly from about 18 uh, pupils per teacher in the 2004 to about 20 uh, in 2011. And if we graph it, it looks something like this. Uh, at some level, this accounts for changes in overall student population because this is pupil per teacher ratio. So we are uh, aware of this. Uh, we are interested in learning more about what happened and in particular if you know we've marked the rollout or the, the, the announcement of the Michigan Merit Curriculum with the dashed line and the solid line indicates the initial implementation of the Michigan Merit Curriculum and the biggest jump in pupil per teacher ratios occurred right in that interval. Uh, and so this was concurrent. We certainly have not sorted out was the pupil per teacher ratio a response to the Michigan Merit Curriculum? Was it any way uh, 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 a part of it? Or was this just purely coincidental? But w and that's part of our task for the future. But as we figure that out, we, we, at the very least, we have to be aware of it. Uh, and we want to learn more. And that's partly why we're asking you uh, questions in the last few hours, but also uh, where we'll be going with our future collection. 
So one of the questions we turn to is, as these pupil per teacher ratios increased, who were the teachers um, who were being retained, if you will, or what types of teachers uh, were in the population? And as you look over time, we noticed an interesting thing, that uh, the, basically the number of uh, Michigan Merit uh, Curriculum teachers uh, stayed about the same, and therefore uh, it dropped a little, but it didn't drop nearly as much as the non-Michigan Merit Curriculum teachers. So what we're taking from this is that in one way or another, schools managed to retain or hire uh, teachers who could teach in the Michigan Merit Curriculum core curricular subject areas. And when we talk about core curriculum, we're talking about basically math, science, uh, much of the core social studies, and language arts. Uh, so these teachers that you see with the, um, the light green bars down below were teaching in those core subject areas. And so the schools tended to retain those teachers or to hire new ones, but one way or another those proportions, the proportions actually went up and the numbers stayed almost the same. So that's a quick little snapshot of some of the things that we've been looking at. Um, and so what we're interested in doing, uh, and we're going to turn the tables on you a little bit, is to make sense of some of what we've been seeing. We, we have done uh, some preliminary analyses in other areas, which I don't want to go into. But before we go into those in the next year and what have you, we wanted to learn a little bit more from you folks about what was going on with these hiring practices. Why might these be taking place? So. This, these are the questions that um, I asked uh, Guan and Caitlin and Beth to roam around and ask folks why were they making the decisions they were making about first about hiring teachers and secondly about allocating teachers to courses and teachers and students to courses just to get a feel for the responses. So they were good enough to do that. And then we met a little bit and talked a little bit. And I'll just give you a feel for some of the things that some of you all said uh, was, was going on. So the first thing is, I had, we, we, you know, of course we're aware that some of this could be economic. And in fact, we, we heard that. We heard that the economic conditions were paramount in making hiring decisions. And in particular that, for example, a lot of the hiring decisions, of course, weren't hiring decisions. It was a question of who to keep. Uh, and so then, and, and sometimes this was via attrition, and sometimes this was via riffing or something like that. But one way or another, what happened was the teacher composition was changing, uh, the numbers were changing, and, but, and we see that the MMC teachers uh, wound up being more likely to be in the resulting teaching population. Uh, a second thing that um, we uh, heard that was very interesting was we've been puzzling about uh, how much schools were doing their hiring explicitly in response to the MMC, uh, how much of it might have been in response to just needing to increase uh, math and science teachers generally out of a general perception or institutional effect. So we weren't sure. And one of the striking things that I think we heard twice was that a couple of school districts, not, they weren't just responding to the MMC, they were anticipating the MMC. That is, in roughly 2005 or something, I think my, I, think I heard two years ahead of time, uh, the, the school districts were actually starting to ramp up their MMC teachers. So that's pretty interesting from a couple different perspectives. One from a research perspective, okay, we need to start t paying attention to that. We can't just mark our implementation line at 2007, for example, because there was an anticipatory implementation. And the second thing is, it suggests that schools are sometimes very forward thinking, you know, and catching the next wave before it even hits. And we certainly hear this with respect to, that we heard it with respect to the Common Core, that uh, there are schools right now that are already anticipating or in the last years have anticipated the Common Core coming and may have already retooled their teacher composition to address the Common Core. Okay, um, on the how the teachers are allocated uh, to, to, to courses, we were, were real interested in sort of the driving forces and we heard a mixture here. So one that we heard was, well, student demand 
drives things. Uh, well, we had to offer these new math and science courses, so we put a smattering of courses out there, students signed up for them, and we had to hustle and get teachers. Uh, the other uh, uh, approach, there were some other approaches that were a little different from that. So what some schools did is they uh, hired generalist teachers uh, or even some part-time teachers. Uh, and the part-time teachers might teach across uh, levels. They might teach in the middle school and the high school, or they might teach across schools. Uh, and the generalist teachers might teach across subject areas. So this is one way to offer some of the new math courses is to, t to hire a generalist teacher who can fill the old science but also teach a couple of new math courses or something like that. So it's interesting how nimble the schools have been and how varied uh, they, they can be in response to the Michigan Merit curriculum. Okay, so there's more I could go into, but one of the things I wanted to do was to put out these few basic responses and then turn the tables a little bit. And the question to you all is, as you see these questions up here, how did you make decisions about hiring teachers and how did you make decisions about allocating students and teachers to courses? And so that's my opening question for you. Um, I'd be interested how much you think the economic conditions were driving things versus other factors, uh, how much control you had, that sort of thing. All right, and I'll pause. Just think, go ahead. Being uh, in a local high school in uh, 2006, and the two issues that I heard from our superintendent were uh, FTEs for students uh, was the biggest factor. What the state was going to give us uh, made a difference on who was employed or not. And then uh, also just losing students. We had natural attrition from the economy where Pfizer and Kiangsu left a lot of employees and so from there, our uh, student count went down, and that was the biggest factor we If we go back and look at the first slide, uh, it's tough to do. Um, there we go. In the center column is the total number of students that were in Michigan uh, from 2004 to 2011. And when we collapsed it to, to the pupil per teacher ratio, you kind of lose track of the fact that it went from about 356,000 to about 315,000. So a loss of 40,000 students, which is really an enormous loss. You know, and, and so we're talking about seven, eight years there. Uh, and so, in fact, you'd expect that a lot of districts would have been responding just to the emergent issue of the, of the loss of students. Okay, thanks. And well, that, that plays in a little bit about why, uh, for me, the question of hiring in 2006 was odd. Because at that time, it wasn't so much the hiring, it was uh, how many staff were you having in class. Okay. And then how many could you? And oftentimes we had discussion at lunch in, in the district and the gentleman that was sitting at my table, they didn't hire. So that's that's the best of how I thought that much was odd. So if it had been rephrased to uh, how did you decide who to retain, it was just awkward to start off that, that question that way. Would the answer have been Michigan Mayor Curriculum was in our on our minds, do you think? At that, at that time, I was a city superintendent, and it wasn't that had nothing to do with it. If I had the opportunity to replace, it, if I had the if I had the opportunity to replace, um, then it, then it most certainly would have been um, in trying to find somebody in math and science, math and or science. But that wasn't that wasn't the issue at the time. It was trying to balance a budget, um, had very little control over the revenue that was coming into the district, and therefore it was all cut. Thank you. Jewelry making, um, a small wood shop classes that our choir, where our high schools, one thirty percent of our students were in in, in choir or band, and now we're down to less than eighteen percent. That the mere curriculum drove them to core classes, and their uh, electives were dwindled. And so many high schools have six, six hours per day, and we even have seven, and it, but we still, our electives are 
and so therefore our drama debate uh, a specialized English class and of course choir and band numbers were, were the enrollees were diminished and the, and the teachers were cut. So, thank you. So I, we, we did hear a few times about the number of electives being reduced. Not only the number, but the number of people, kids taking electives. There was someone, yeah. Uh, 2006, I was in a pretty small district and the difference was it wasn't necessarily uh, the number of people hiring or who we were hiring, it was the certifications that they had. So they had to have, you know, having dual certifications or being able to teach a lot of different things, being flexible was a lot more important because we knew things were going to be changing and some of those classes might not be in existence in a few years and we might need them to be strictly be math down the road. So it was kind of some forward thinking about which teachers to hire, not necessarily the numbers. So that's really interesting because it goes to um, Superintendent Flanagan's comment about, well, I don't need math, right? But if you could come in with a dual certification, uh, you were probably much more marketable because you had this versatility over the long run. So, exactly. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we're hearing some of that. And, and I'm, I'm kind of curious, to, as we explore our data, um, to see how much of that versatility was really manifest at around 2006, 2007, that sort of thing. Whereas I mean, we're going to look to see prior to that how much people were more focused in a single area. So that's something for us to look at. I'm also from a small rural school and I guess I would like to say we, as far as looking at this, we were one of the schools anticipating, but I would say not you know, we weren't hiring. It was when somebody retired. We were looking how to replace that person. Um, our staff has continued continued to shrink for as long as I can remember, and we're still trying to do the best we can to not have it affect students and serve them in the best way possible. But we're looking at dual certifications and how we can best use resources. So, so. When, when you look at dual certifications and you're reducing, I'm just curious if you can keep the microphone there because I'm curious. And I'm only a counselor. I just know how my principal. Well, but the counselor actually it. knows what's going on in the school, right? <laughs> um, we know a lot. Uh, so the question is, did existing teachers seek dual certification, you know, understanding this press that was coming? Or did you, did you, you know, basically uh, teachers uh, retired and then you were looking to hire dual, dual certification? A lot of those elective classes that kids used to have that we no longer have. And I think our, our students who have special needs and their skills aren't as strong. Some of those, the foods class, foods and nutrition class, or the, um, you know, the, the electives that were for a variety of students. As those people retired, we looked to replace with other other needs, certification needs. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, but it was as they retired. So, so you you was the, you chose to hire differently. Is that? Not always. Okay. That went as well. Okay. So I would say, initially maybe we were able to replace, but. No. I mean, now we're bare bones. Okay. And still trying to serve it in the best way we can. All right. Well, I appreciate your participating in the exercise, both as uh, you might have interacted with um, some of our team during the first few hours and, and for this part. Uh, it's, it's helpful to us. We're going to keep asking. In, in lots of different ways. Maybe if you're in one of our uh, 150 sample schools, maybe at this kind of venue uh, a year from now or something like that. Uh, we really are interested to know uh, the experiences that you all have had and how varied they were. And then our job is to try to capture that and interpret it in terms of the larger scale data that we're analyzing. Okay, so thank you very much.